Good morning, my name is David Mackey. I will be presenting today's paper along with my co-author Sigrid Arnott. Our paper is entitled Women's Portages, Colonial Encounters, Gender and Indigenous Worldview in the Great Lakes. In this paper we explore the disjunction between what we often think about the fur trade and portaging and what was actually happening during the fur trade. So in most narratives of the fur trade, there's a real bias that male voyageurs, those with at least some European ancestry, like we see in this picture here, were the, pad were the paddlers and portages along water-based travel routes. And in fact, an image that reinforces this narrative hangs above my desk. Yet a closer look at ethnographic sources reveals the importance of indigenous women in water-based travel in the Great Lakes into the fur trade era. These cultural stereotypes and the resulting archaeological literature influenced my initial assessment of the Grand Portage of the St. Louis River, or Gichi Onigam, a heritage site that my co-author David and Mackie and I identified with an all-Indigenous crew of local descendants nearly a decade ago. Despite the evidence that Indigenous families were the most common people canoeing on the waterways surrounding Lake Superior or Gichigami, I had been led to expect that the Portage Trail archaeology would tell the story of the fur trade through trade good artifacts. Perhaps I was lucky in the long run that the remains we found were simply the impressions of thousands of footsteps taken through time on the clay soil. This is an example of a traditional Anishinaabe string map that was recorded by the anthropologist Francis Densmore in 1929. But we know that far before this, long before this, the Anishinaabe were making similar string maps on birch bark. And these maps both tell, told stories of what happened on the trail, but they also could be given to other people to help them guide them through these very elaborate webs of water-based travel that strung together rivers, lakes, and portages. And these travel routes were appropriated in the fur trade, but we know that they long predated that period of colonization. Um, and we also know that it was women paddling the canoes and often carrying boats, babies, and belongings over these trails as they followed a systematic annual round directed by their plant relatives. In traditional Ojibwe story maps, totems or totems, stand in for the identity of the travelers in the boats. We usually see the father and children with one clan animal shown in the bow and center, with the mother and her unique sign in the stern. And this was seen in the previous map where there was a symbol for the mother in the back and another one for the family in the front. So from these maps, we know that there are women in the stern of all these um, canoe trips. Here is a map created by Joseph Nicollet in the 1830s. This map depicts the locations of villages, foot trails, and portage routes in the western Lake Superior region. Depicted here using elevation data collected during the shuttle radar topography mission in the year 2000. Here are the major 19th century population centers within the western Lake Superior region including Sandy Lake, where 400 Anishinaabe were starved to death in 1850 during the U.S. government's failed attempt to ethnically cleanse northwest Wisconsin. The region is a maze of waterways. However, some rivers had special significance as portage routes. The routes highlighted here connect western Lake Superior to the Mississippi River. The big picture, these routes connect the Algonquin speaking peoples of the Great Lakes to the Mississippian world and beyond, including us here and now in New Orleans. Indigenous people are skilled canoe builders and paddlers, yet they never underestimate the dangers of being on water, the domain of Michi Bichi, an ungendered and plural underwater relative. If properly honored, Michi Bichi carries boats, but this Manidu's tremendous power is most evident in dangerous rapids, falls, and whirlpools, where boats capsize and people drown, places that must be completely avoided by portaging or accommodated by unloading boats. 
Most of the Gichi Onigam is a detour around water flowing over exposed bedrock. And you can see part of the area that's detoured on the left here. Michi Bichi would permit emptied canoes to be pulled or dragged through some rapids, but only after women disembarked to carry all the cargo, including small children, in cradle boards around these sections. These parts of the trail were known as women's portages and are aware of voyageurs would practice de charge. So it was <clears throat> that indigenous water spirits living underwater at elevation changes animate the force of water engendered the use of some sections of portage trails. And I note here that within Anishinaabe culture, gender is a self-determined choice with many options on how one uses, chooses to live. Almost all the primary sources about historic portaging, perhaps all of them, come from the perspective of white males during a period of extractive colonization. In the area that became Minnesota, these Pale males represent just a tiny population of those who lived and traveled on the periphery of indigenous life here. So in 1823, when Schoolcraft came through, he took a census of many of the villages that they went through. Um, they were often vaccinating people for um, uh, smallpox, so they were able to really count the people there. And um, we, although many of the larger villages are represented, he also noticed on many t occasions that the smaller villages, the people were not there, they were out gathering or hunting somewhere else. So this census is probably really on the low side of the people who were living there. And we can see at Fond du Lac and Sandy Lake in the bottom statistical facts representing the fur trade, there are just two white people at Fond du Lac and Sandy Lake. Each and I think actually that Aiken and Davenport went back and forth between Fond du Lac and Sandy Lake. Um, so there's just two white people. And in contrast, there were 546 indigenous people at um, Sandy Lake and Fond du Lac together, with the largest demographic being indigenous women. You can see on the top at Sandy Lake this pattern. Total population at Sandy Lake was 315. The number of men was 70 and the number of women was 83. So indigenous women is the largest proportion of the population. And this general pattern holds through in the entire region that they surveyed, um, west all the way to um, the Dakotas, north to Grand Portage, the Rainy River, and Pembina. Um, the population of white people that they recorded was less than 2%. And considering that they missed probably many indigenous people, it's probably closer to less than 1%. So not only is there a problem where there's just a tiny proportion of people who are making the records, those people tended to be coming to the area to conquer people, to convert them, or to capitalize on them. And their descriptions of the Anishinaabe women are very sparse and biased. Um, so here we see a young girl who's um, really practicing to portage. This is how things were carried across portages on a tump line from the forehead. And um, women carried all the belongings of the home this way and were known for being incredibly strong. And yet the way they're described in the literature is often these less than human beasts of burden. Portage locations of the Western Lake Superior region. There are two types of river portages. The first is a portage around an obstacle. For example, waterfalls and impassable rapids. The second are connections between watersheds. This typically occurs in the upper reaches of a river, often through swamps and muskeg. Each route has one of each portage type. The upper reaches of the Brule and the Savannah rivers had portages that were basically slogs through swamps, while the St. Croix and the St. Louis River each had portages around major whitewater obstacles. Next, we will take a closer look at the Brule and St. Croix River portages. Here is a detail from the 1830s Nicollet map showing the village of Amik, which means beaver, trails and a woman's portage downstream from a succession of rapids. Now we will take a look at Nicollet's depiction of the Grand Portage. <laughs> 
Here is a detail of Nicolet's map showing vi village locations and portage routes around a major whitewater obstacle. And here is the location of the Grand Portage as mapped by our team in 2014 using a combination of LIDAR analysis, field survey, and historic document analysis. This portage bypasses waterfalls and rapids where the river encounters a 600 foot change in elevation over the course of some 10 miles. Women's portages are located at the upstream and downstream ends of the route, highlighted in yellow here. The women's portages traverse some of the most rugged terrain of the entire Grand Portage. Many primary sources describing women in more detail record their lives as wives to literate white men, leading to an overemphasis, I believe, in historical literature of women as mediators in social relationships. Worse sometimes, much of the work women did was just invisible to white eyes, even when they needed it for survival. The eyewitness accounts of native life during the fur trade, I believe, can only provide accurate context for archeologists when viewed through the lens of ethnographic sources from indigenous women themselves, even though much of it is from the reservation period. So as an example, there was a missionary with school scraps expedition who described women portaging, stating, several families keep along in company with us when on their way to their summer hunting ground. The woman is often seen with all the materials on her back, which makes the Indian's house and all the articles with which furnish it, such as kettles, wooden ladles, drum, traps, and axes, and on top of it all, the Indian cradle in which is bound her nursing child. <clears throat> Although I love this excerpt for the information it gives about what women did carry, the 20th century Anishinaabekwe Nodinans from Mill Axe provides the real context for their trip. This description of moving camp in June is clearly less about going to quote hunting grounds and more about moving the entire household to the family's summer base camp where wild rice had been cached the previous fall and where June berries, strawberries and gooseberries would soon be ripening. And I love this image here because it shows women doing um, moving house in their canoes. Um, you can see the mats that made up the sides and the birch bark that made the roof. And they're doing this even though they're in a river with um, logs from the logging period. So it shows how this tradition continued even after the reservation period. At summer camps, women also netted fish and smoked them after catching them in the nettle nets they had made during the winter while men were pursuing game. As Dave will describe, the Anishinaabeg families who were on the rivers and portage trails were following their plant and animal relatives in a systematic seasonal round where hunting was just one element of their life. Here is a view of the major portages of the Northwest Passage. The village of Fond du Lac is located just downstream from the Grand Portage at a major fish spawning area where fish were easily netted or speared. This overlay shows the locations of rising lakes in the region. We can see how the portage trails connect the village of Fond du Lac to the rich resources of the Sandy Lake area. Yet another overlay adds the location of sugarbush resources in the region. This layer was created from the Marshner pre-settlement vegetation map of Minnesota. Plotting the locations of archaeological sites begins to reveal patterns of the seasonal round which are further fleshed out with the addition of foot trails mapped during the government land office surveys of the mid to late 19th century. Both wild rice and sugarbush resources are plentiful at Perch Lake within the heart of the modern Fond du Lac Reservation, outlined in yellow in this slide. These resources are available in the springtime for maple sugar, in the late summer and early fall for wild rice. The fur trade had a massive metabolism that was exclusively fueled by calories to move goods along water and over land. Foods from the animal, fish, and plant relatives in Anishinaabe territory supported the fur trade, and only groups of indigenous women were harvesters and processors of the sugar and wild rice that helped people outlive long winters in this region. <laughs> 
Metal trade kettles combined with the appetite of the fur trade likely intensified indigenous women's focus on the harvest and processing of maple sugar and the gnomon, reinforcing rather than replacing those essential aspects of the ongoing woodland tradition. And here is a quick video showing the continuing use of an historic treaty kettle. Keep on parching, Dave. You're looking good there, man. Bird up. Bird up. This ancient pattern of seasonal travel did not end with the fur trade. The annual round instead encompassed and accommodated it. Even during periods of intense historic colonization, <clears throat> people continued to portage within the annual rounds of the woodland tradition. In fact, there's a recent PhD dissertation by the indigenous archaeologist Travis Armstrong that describes portaging and temporary camps for wild ricing well into the 1930s in northern Minnesota. When indigenous women's lives are largely interpreted within the context of colonizing spaces, where they traded and smoothed social relations, we lose sight of their deep relationships to the landscape. <clears throat> this blindness supports the idea that their homeland was a terra nullis, an invented colonialist space where people wandered in search of game, but where no one claimed rights and responsibilities to their plant and animal relations at a sugar bush, a berry patch, a rice bed, or a fishing shoal. And I have a picture here of Janice Fairbanks, who helped us with versions of this paper, standing on the Portage Trail. Um, and on the left, we see someone she greatly admires, her grandmother, Cecilia Robinson, directing a sugar brush camp in the 1950s at Fond du Lac. And this is probably a camp that's still being used today, maybe even right now. By using documents written by the 2% without considering their biases and analyzing archaeology in isolation from surviving indigenous traditions, archaeologists, myself included, have reproduced the power of colonizing narratives. We often lose sight of how the core kinship relationships of indigenous people, particularly women, survived and even flourished during the fur trade outside of colonizing spaces. Water-based portage archaeology sites can record the footsteps of the ancestors on their annual rounds, reminding us of where they were going and why. Conclusions The woodland tradition did not end at the start of the fur trade. Plant and animal relatives directed and gendered seasonal travel and still do today. Indigenous women have been largely ignored except for their role in social relations. In fact, Indigenous women were the largest demographic on the portages. And finally, colonialist source materials have biased archaeological interpretations, especially as they relate to portage archaeology.